It's time for the Wrestling Perspective Podcast. I'm Dennis Farrell. That is Lars Fredrickson. Lars, I, I don't even want to do any of the mumbo jumbo bullshit we do at the top of the show because this is an interview that I've been waiting on since 2016. And Trevor, you may not know this, and I it'll lead into a question, but this background is something I wanted to knock off the top of the podcast, which you don't talk a lot about. But we've been Facebook friends forever. You you may not know it, but we have it. Uh, when PD Williams and myself started the podcast, you were going through this period in your life where you couldn't get booked. You would go on your Facebook page and you would say, I will come to your show for free. I will do a seminar for free. Just someone let me be on their show and, and nothing. And this happened year after year after year. And it, and it broke my heart. And PDI I wanted you on. And I think you were polite. You were like, look, nobody wants to hear from me. I think I'm done. Uh, but thank you. And be, be watching. It, it, I think it started with a little show here and a little show there. And then you blink an eye. And now you're a two-time NWA champion. And you, nobody ever talks about it, it, in your life that this period where you couldn't even beg to be booked. And here you go, basically bringing yourself up. You were, I, I remember a post where you're like, I, I'm a three-time WWE Tag Team Champion. How can I not get booked on a show? And I think you went on to driving trucks for a short time. And it, it made you become more of a person in my eyes. So sitting here right now doing this podcast with you, I am like overwhelmed with pride for you. So thank you so much. Right on, man. Thank you, buddy. So I don't... I, I let, let me just ask this. You were the lowest of the low. How close were you from just walking away and saying, fuck the wrestling industry? Um, You know, man, like I was right there. Uh, you get to be a point where you just feel like you're not welcome. You know what I mean? Like nobody, you, you got people that's always trying to hustle you. That's the biggest like shit about pro wrestling at times is like, there's always somebody trying to bottom dollar you and you know, your value, but you just want to wrestle. You know what I mean? You just want to be in front of the people. Um, and with the combination of always trying to be hustled with the combination of wrestling for shitty promoters, you just get to a point where you're like, is this really worth it? This, this isn't the dream. You know what I mean? As a young guy, when you're thinking about where you want to be at the business, that wasn't it. So, um, yeah, there were several times where I just wanted to walk from it. But, you know, thankfully, I've always had that. I've hung out just long enough for something else to pick up for me. And this last big run with the NWA, obviously, things have skyrocketed for me. Well, did you find yourself through these, you know, sort of, I would say, tumultuous periods of time, did you find yourself like wanting it more, you know, like did, did it like, because I know for me personally, professionally, like when somebody tells me I can't or somebody tells me, hey, you might, you don't, you know, we're not going to pay you what you're worth. And it sounds to me like you stuck to your guns, but did, did, did you find that like, maybe not a want it more, but. I'm going to show these motherfuckers kind of thing. No, obviously it's a, you get pissed, you know, like, especially after you've done something, you went out and you, you've proven to the world that you can go out and have great matches and you can, you can entertain people and you still have people. For me, it was always the way I looked physically. I've always been judged by the way I look because you're ne I'm never going to have an ab. I'm never going to be the jacked cut guy. You have um, one ab. You have one, one ab. <laughs> it's a gas tank for a love machine, boys. You know what I mean? Like, well, you know, what, from what I hear, the tool, a tool the size of yours needs a shed. <laughs> right. I'm loving it, boys. I'm loving it. Um, you know, and that's that in a lot of ways has hindered my career, where it's closed a lot of doors for me. And um, I, that would piss me off because I'm like, my talent doesn't dictate what I look like. I, there's a lot of guys that look like me that I know could whip the shit out of people. And I think we all know that guy that's like, he's not a bodybuilder. He's not a, he's not a guy that's going out lifting heavy weights, but it's just his job. It's who he is. And he's that guy you just tell like, just leave him alone. Just, just yeah. don't fuck with him. You know what I mean? And um, I've, 
I've always thought like, well, why does my look have to be what dictates how 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 far I go? You know what I mean? There's a lot of badasses in the world that don't have a six pack. And so I've stuck to my guns in that. And it's worked out, but it's also held me back in a lot of it too. Well, NWA is classic. I, you have that classic NWA look. It is built for the guy that goes out, comes back with the greasy hands and, and is a hardworking guy who can relate to the people. You have that truck driver. As I said before, you've gone through, I, I've, I've, I've literally watched you grow as where's the set sounds. I've watched you grow up before my Facebook eyes and they open the doors. You, you, how do you get involved with this? Because once again, you have the look eighties wrestling. You would have been the top of the top. Well, I Harley always would tell me that shit. And as a young guy, you're like, man, that's so cool. But it really, it's never going to go back to the eighties. Mm -hmm. Um, when when Harley passed away, I was that was kind of uh, like to me, it felt like it was a time for me to really get out of the business. I thought about it, but it was time felt like it was um, start. I really kind of started with Harley. He passed away. It was time to go. Uh, but the representatives from NWA, um, Nick, all this world champion and Dave Lagana, the executive producer at the time, came to Harley's funeral. And um, they actually cornered me at the end of the funeral and go, you know, hey, what are you doing nowadays? I explained to them, I was just kind of on my way out and they said, Hey, we're, we're starting this new show called power. Come down for one show. Um, and I said, really, I'm not interested. They said, just come down for one, just do one show. And I agreed. And, uh, I ended up wrestling Ricky Starks and I had a great match and I come in the back and Nick and uh, Billy were there and they were like, we've already got you booked for tomorrow. And, and it just, kind of steamrolled from there boys it it's um it's crazy how things go really Lars I think he's frozen I think we lost Lars for a second well while he's frozen and we'll figure him out uh I, I you bounce back you you become NWA champion can you talk a little bit about how that came to be what did you know the night before did you know coming into it weeks of Vance when did you find out you were going to be NWA champion um I had been told a couple weeks leading into the chase that that was what the plans were um I've been in the business long enough to not get excited about anything because I've had things change at the curtain for me um and so I didn't really believe it was going to happen until literally my music hit and I was walking down to the ring and I was like, well, shit, they can't change this shit now. Like it's got to happen, you know? Um, and being at the chase and wrestling Nick Aldis and first, that's the first time that any wrestling had happened um, at the chase for 37 years, my wife and kids were there. It was, um, it was a magical moment for a guy who would come through some really rough times in his career I kind of felt like, wow, like it's really going to be hard to top that. I cut out, I think, or you guys cut out for me. I don't know. My internet's pretty fucking good, so it must be you two guys, obviously. <laughs> we'll the take tape until later. <laughs> well, um, you know, we were talking where I got kind of cut off was, was when we were talking about the body type, you know, and and I, I did have a question regarding that. I don't know if we already covered it, but. You know, when we talk about, see, I always saw you as kind of like a throwback, but you also brought the modern. So, you know, and I don't want to stick on the whole body type because I think it's talent. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, your talent outshines any anything any way that you look. But just paying homage, like you did with Harley and things like that. How important is you know, you know, now that you're in this in the NWA, you're holding that ten pounds of gold. How important is that tradition, that her heritage, to you? Maybe it was, were you a fan prior to getting into the business, unless we covered this already? No, no, no. I was a huge wrestling, a huge NWA fan. I was a huge Harley fan. Um, and being a Harley guy, um, it's important, like, for me to kind of, at the very least, when you see me step into the, into the ring, my time on TV, that I still kind of carry a little bit of his heritage and the way he thought wrestling should be. Um, I, people call me a throwback, but I really don't know how to wrestle any other way. You know what I mean? It's just, 
how I was trained and how I've evolved. And it just so happens that I carry, a, I mimic a lot of what Harley does in the ring. Um, and it's good for people to remember, like there was a time before the, the smoke and the lights and the mirrors and all the music and the, the glitz and glamor, the real hoopla of pro wrestling. There was a time where it was just two guys in the ring just kicking the shit out of each other. You know what I mean? And and that's the type of wrestling that like gets me fired up is, you know, like the whole, like, I know pro wrestling's fake, but that dude's a real motherfucker. You know what I mean? Like that's, and I pop part of my language, but like when you see two guys go out there and just lay the wood to each other, um, to me, that's, that's really pro wrestling. You know what I mean? You, you abusing, using their bodies to entertain me. Well, yeah, I, when I say the word throwback, I mean, you actually bring fucking psychology and you bring <laughs> a, a, a movement because, I mean, you know, it, it's nothing, you know, pro wrestling, just like anything, music, whatever it is, it's got to progress. It's always going to change and it's always right. going to evolve into something, you know, uh, that, that, that it wasn't 20 years prior, right? My point is, is that the one thing that, keep, that's, that, that stays consistent in pro wrestling, most, some of the time, I will say, is the psychology you got to be able to tell that story correct so sure. when i when i say throwback that i i mean but like i said also a modern twist you can see that you you know you can do just about anything right with anyone but you still bring that psychology so my question to you is this you know a lot of the the, the modern pro wrestling is all about spots it's not really about you know it's about the the pop it's about getting the crowd to go whoa and not not really actually bring them in so, you know, learning from Harley and all these things, you know, the, one of the questions I've always wanted to ask, because since you were trained there, how important was it? Like, did he beat that into you guys? Was he like the one that you got to bring the story? You gotta, I mean, how does that work? Um, for him, it was about having an emotional connection. It was about being real. And that's you doing things that you would do in a real quote unquote a real fight you know what i mean um for harley it was, a, it was about he had us do shit over and over and over again and then he would have us do do another spot or another uh another angle i guess or um like for example he'd like go in there and work the leg and you'd have to spend 25 minutes focusing on working the leg it's not you know well you can't pick up a guy and run him if right. you're working on his leg so you have to literally stop and think, okay, what can I do to keep the action going? All right, you get done with that, go in there and work the arm. All right, that's, you'd have to go in there and you would think about what you could and couldn't do to work the arm. And then you'd go to the back and you would do this repetitively to a point where it just became like walking, like breathing, like, you know what I mean? Your ideas would just pop up. So when you were in the ring, it's very easy to tell that story naturally because you've got all these kind of things to pull from. Does that make sense? 100%. Oh, yeah. You know, um, I, I remember a time kind of just being a young guy and being an, an idiot and just asking Harley, like, Jesus, Harley, why do you make us do that over and over and over again? He goes, because I just, I don't want you to think about it. Cause if you're not thinking about that, you're thinking about what you have to do in the ring. Like what, you know what I mean? Because when you're in that ring, there's such, so many things to think about, whether it be your wind, whether it be the people, your time, what the, the emotional connection you've built so far with the people. Um, that, that shit's really important to me. That's how I, in my opinion, I've gotten over throughout the years is I've been able to connect, uh, create a, uh, an emotional connection with people whether it be in, in whatever match I'm having, whether it be a promo I'm doing, I think I can really like reach in and touch the people and make them feel what I'm feeling, whether it be I'm angry or I'm chasing after the gold or I'm having an emotional moment or happiness, whatever it is. I feel like I'm really blessed in being able to have an emotional connection with people. How I, I lived in St. Louis for many 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 years i call it kind of home for me i saw harley many times in the casino oh. you know gambling away money and i'm a little kid i'm like that's that's harley race playing you know blackjack holy shit so i you know we kind of have that i saw him in the casino i didn't train with him so it's not really that connection but i'm trying man i'm trying but 
uh, how are you going about this run in your career as you did the others? As we talked, there was a huge hiatus in between the two. What is your mindset the second time around? Um, really on this one, it's fucking kill them all. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I, I know that that sounds a little hateful, but like when I won the title the first time, I kind of felt like that was for Harley. That was for my family. That was for St. Louis. That was for all my critics that said, Oh, you can never do it. Um, this one's, this one's all for me. This is all I'm, I'm here to burn the fucking world. Scorch the earth. Uh, let everybody know that I'm, I'm the world's heavyweight champion. If there was ever a question before, by the time I'm done with this run, there will be none. You know what I mean? Uh, that first time I listened to a lot of people and I tried to make a lot of people happy and it, it ultimately didn't get me where I wanted. Whereas, um, I guess the fuck them all attitude right now where I'm only kind of focusing on myself is, is really done well. And I, and I know it sounds cliche. I've heard stories of top guys that were just, everybody thought they were dickheads, but they were always on top and they were always doing something great. And they were always making that good money. Um, and I always told myself, I didn't want to be that guy, but man, when I got back into a corner and realized that my career's on the downward slope. And if I really want this, I better do it. Um, once I pulled the trigger and just started focusing on me, myself and I, man, that shit's taken off. <laughs> and I know it sounds, I know it sounds fucked up, but it, it, it is. It, it doesn't, not at all. Uh, and my follow-up question is who do you listen to now uh, with, with Harley gone? You've made it quite clear that he's the guy that you kind of leaned on. Who do you lean on now in the industry? Man, I don't, I don't really have anybody, you know what I mean? And I know that sounds like boo hoo or anything like that, but like, who, how are you going to replace Harley Reigns? You know what I mean? Like there is no, there's no backup to that. Um, what I'm doing now is, is just relying on experience and time. Guys, I've been doing this 22 years. Uh, I was a part of impact their impacts first shows when they started. I got a chance to be a part of WWE. I've experienced 22 years of experience that I'm relying on. Um, and right now I'm going with my gut and, and just, you know, fuck them all, man. I'm, I'm here to get mine and, and that's how I'm going to, how it's going to be. Well, you know, you're you're in this stage of your career where now you're a two-time uh, world champion, and maybe you've had a little time to reflect. Um, do you feel like you have the creative freedom, and right now at this stage of your career, that maybe that you didn't experience in your past? Oh, Oh, one hundred percent. Like um, I'm in a company and in a place um, that I have a voice that people at least listen to me and they value my, my opinion. Um, Billy is, uh, he's a very open book kind of guy. It's a little strange because first, you know, you deal with so many egos in the pro wrestling business and then you come up to Billy and he's like, all right, just talk to me. Just, you know, down to earth guy. And he's a, uh, he's a very open door mentality. Um, the fact that he, he does give me a chance to voice my opinion. Um, makes me feel excited about my work again you know what i mean wrestling uh is something you're ultimately supposed to be love and enjoy it's supposed to be hard work but you're supposed to love and enjoy it um and nwa has given me that opportunity guys like they've they've listened to my opinion on things they followed some things that i've done there's been times they've looked at me and said no we're just not going to do that but that shit was straight to my face you know what i mean there's um there's no horse shit and, and I, I know, I know that sounds, again, I keep saying it sounds strange, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm the type of guy, like, even if it's bad news, as long as you directly tell me to my face, I'll respect you. I may not like the news. Most people won't, but I'll at least respect the fact that you're direct and honest with me. And when you're working for people like that, it just, you know, it does nothing but make you feel good and want to go out there and do things that, you know, that people a haven't seen for a long time or b has never seen before like um i had a match with tom latimer you guys know tom latimer yep. beast just a beast um we did maybe i don't know three or four seasons ago uh tom and i had a singles match and we were talking about it and i know i'm breaking kayfabe but i was like tom what if i didn't get like one offense move and he's like what and i was like you just kicked my ass for like four and a half minutes like I don't even get to swing a punch at you 
And out of nowhere, I roll you up and I pull trunks and just, you know, and he got to thinking about it. He's like, hell yeah. And nobody was, we told Billy about it and he was, he's a little unsure at first, but he's like, you know, you guys are the wrestlers go out there and, you know, do what you do. Um, and we went out there and just killed it. Tom being the beast that he is and me trusting him just beat my ass for a good four or five minutes. I mean, bounced me around. And at the end, he shot me in the corner and I rolled him up one, two, three, and the place went nuts. Nobody lost anything. We had a good, solid match. We told a story. And nobody had done that in such a long time because you gotta, you can't have an ego in that situation. You know what I mean? You can't be, you know, I'm not sacrificing myself. I'm not losing anything. This dude's a stud. Of course he'd beat my ass. You know what I mean? But it's, it's that kind of shit that gets me excited and fun. You know what I mean? Because that's that stuff no one sees, no one, no one expects to have. Follow me on this question. And I'm trying to work it out as I'm going to ask it, but follow me on this. Uh, Nick Aldis was a different kind of champion. He was more of a businessman and he knew how to get out there and market himself. You are a blue collar champion. What do you feel like you have to do to maybe start getting yourself? I, I don't know through the forbidden door, if that's even what you want to do. Uh, I, Cause it, it just seems like, you know, when Nick was champion, he was kind of out and about and everywhere. You've you're a two-time champion now and the most believable NWA champion to me. And I think also the Lars, we've talked about this many times. What do you have to do? I'm, in my opinion, I just got to stay the course. Like, you know, you guys said, um, the most believable champion. I am nothing like Nick in that aspect. We are two different people. We bring two different things to the, the world championship. Um, I'm definitely not as pretty and outgoing as Nick, uh, but I, I think I bring an aggressive, an aggression and a brutality and a realism to the belt that Nick couldn't even get close to. Um, but that also goes back to people having to see the value of what I do when I get in the ring. You know what I mean? That's I'm a different cat. And if you don't know pro wrestling, I think, you know, it's very easy to pass me by, but I think somebody who has experience in pro wrestling can see like what I bring to the show and why I'm the NWA world champion. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. So Speaking of Nick Aldis, because I mean, with every great protagonist, you need a great antagonist. Did you sure. foresee the chemistry you two were going to have? Um, I I felt it in the ring. We had one match, um, just an exhibition match in that first, I think, first or second season, and we stepped into the ring, and it you could feel the chemistry in there. You know what I mean? And the people could feel the intensity of Nick and I. And we play off each Big. other very well, very well. Um, and he's legitimately the complete opposite of me. You know, you know, he's pretty, I'm rugged, you know, he's, he's rich. I, I got, I save my money. Uh, you know, he's, he's complete opposite and, and Nick gets it too. That's the good thing. Um, you got to have an opponent that understands what pro wrestling really is. And, um, and Nick gets the business. He gets the I the the storytelling of it. He gets what what needs to be done in there to get over that story. Um, in my opinion, what Nick and I did last year at the Chase for those six months is probably some of the best storytelling in pro wrestling in a long time. How what was it like to wrestle in the Chase? I, I I've been to the old barn. I've been to the Kill, and now the new stadium. Uh, I moved out of there before independent wrestling really, I guess, at my age, uh, caught on and blew up in St. Louis. So what was it like, you know, doing all this in your hometown? Um, it due to, I mean, it was, it was exciting. It was emotional. They, um, there's a, a, a bridgeway or like a, a, a walkway under the road that goes to the old, uh, TV station that used to be across the street. And when they taped wrestling there. And so they took us down. It's all blocked off now. General public can't get to it. But they took us through there and told us Flair had been through through there. Ted DiBiase, Harley, all the names had been there. They showed us where the locker rooms where the guys were. Um, to walk on that stage and just take a pause for a minute and, like, superimpose Harley's match in there. And, and the people that used to come in with suits and ties 
um, it was, man, it, it was an emotional moment, but it was, it felt good. You know, it felt like I was in the right place at the right time. Uh, again, 37 years, they hadn't had a wrestling match there. And I got the main event in there for the world's heavyweight title. Like if, you know, cementing myself in history, you know, that was one of those moments, guys. You know what I mean? Like it, yeah. really a career bucket list scenario. Well, you got guys like Homicide down there now and Ricky Morton oh, and a lot of these great minds of professional wrestling. Um, you know, one of the things I always wonder is how often do, 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 do you ever utilize their minds? Do you ever ask them questions to ask them to watch your matches, anything like that? Oh, for sure. Um, that's the one like kind of badass thing about the NWA locker room. Like there, uh, there is no egos where we can't, you know, we feel uncomfortable to go talk to a homicide or, or Ricky Morton. Um, actually homicides got me booked several times because I've asked his opinion on my matches and he's like, man, I want to work. Can you make you. sure I'm not, no one's on the internet, please, babe. <laughs> I keep freezing. He, he, you're still here, Lars. Yeah, we got you, brother. Um, and, and I would, I would be silly not to ask guys like homicide for advice. And, and cause those are my peers. Those are guys that, you know, I, I've even, you know, I talked to Tyrus, I talked to Chris Adonis, guys that I respect, um, Aaron Stevens, that guys that I know that have done some really great things in this business and, and they all have chips on their shoulders too. Um, those guys, we all try to look out for each other. So yeah, man, I, I definitely utilize those guys. Uh, and what's cool about it is we elevate ourselves with honesty. I bring that up a lot because like, I've never gotten better with somebody coming up to me and patting me on the back going, Oh man, you're great. Like your shit's, your shit's awesome, man. I've gotten better because somebody's walked up to me and pulled me to the side and said, Hey man, I was looking at this and man, when you did this, it, it looked like shit. Like <laughs> you, you don't do it. Or, or fix it, you know what I mean? Like, right on, I appreciate it. You know what I mean? It's, it's one of those scenarios, like, if you have a booger in your nose and you walk <laughs> around and no one tells you that you've got a booger in your nose, but that one friend looks at you and goes, hey, dumb shit, you've got a booger in your nose. Thanks, bro. I wish somebody would have gave me a heads up. In that locker room, everybody gives, you know, they're not afraid to give you a heads up because they just want to help elevate. Do you... I've seen pictures. You've done the suit thing, but you're not a suit guy to me. How how hard is it to get you into a suit to to play that part of the champion? Uh, can you be an NWA champion without putting on a suit? I sure as hell gonna try, fellas. Like <laughs> you know what I mean. Like I I did put on the suit for the picture uh, when I first won the title because uh, again I think I was kind of trying to walk in my mentor's shoes a little bit. You know what I mean? He had the picture of the title and in his blue jacket and it was kind of like my homage to him. But um, as you guys can tell in this second run, you haven't seen a suit jacket anywhere. Uh, this is, you know, all about me. Um, I'm, I guess I'm realistic in the fact that, you know, I, I'm, I'm, this is my second time as world heavyweight champion. There may not be a third. So at the very least, I want to go out and, and I want people to remember me as world champion the way I want to, you know, I want them to remember Trevor Murdoch, not just, Harley races, Trevor Murdoch. Well, you've been, you know, in the ring with a lot of these great competitors, gold dust, you know, guys like this. Like, I mean, as a kid, being a fan of wrestling, watching, you know, come up, when you get into the ring with a guy like that, are you especially nervous? You know, I know for me, like if, when we played with the Ramones every night, like that was, that was another gig. That was a, that you weren't concentrated on anybody else. I mean, even Metallica was on that bill, but we weren't fucking concerned about them. We were, we were like, we want to be like the Ramones. But so my question is, is, is it a different kind of energy that you're bringing? Well, it's, it, there's two things. There's one part of you, like, I feel like a little kid, you know what I mean? Like, oh, shit, I'm in there with gold dust, yeah. Um, you have every video game you played in the ring, you know, in your mind is playing. But then there's a sense of pride that steps in, like, okay, like, I'm, I'm in here with this guy because I can go with him. I right. can, you know, somebody trusts me and this guy, now it's my time to prove to the world that I belong here. So there's a, a certain amount of, we go back to what we were talking about earlier about like, just, I don't know, maybe gumption, animosity, like I'm fucking ready to go. Let's, let's bring it. So there's, that's always been kind of like a part of my gimmick. Like I just, 
all right, motherfucker, you say I can't do this? All right, this is what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to do it in my way. You know what I mean? And and it's it's worked out. It's just I've always had to play the long game. <laughs> well, you know, uh, my second part of that question is, is that because – Holly races school, the whole thing, your connection there. Do you think some of a lot of the older vets that you got into the ring with, you know, there was a different respect because of how you were trained? They, it definitely got those guys to be a little bit more calm around me. You know what I mean? Like, they're like, oh, you're a Harley, you're a Harley guy. Oh, so you can work. All right, well, let's, let's go out here and uh, let's go out here. And it, it, it made them feel more comfortable with me. So I could get maybe better matches out of them, or I could do maybe different stuff with some of those top guys. Um, and it it didn't take long uh, for for people to realize that's why I was I did get so far. Um, my first six months in WWE, everybody I wrestled, uh, well, we'll just say a couple guys, but you know there was a lot of animosity because I went straight from the independents to TV. I got signed six weeks later. I'm WWE Tag Team Champion, and again. There's not an ab on me, and I've never stepped in developmental. So there was some animosity with some of those guys, and they would go in there, and they would run me and run me and run me. And I wouldn't blow up. I just got out of the dojo six months from Japan. Like, you weren't going to blow me up. But I had to prove to them that I could wrestle, and that's why I was there. And once, once they knew I could wrestle, those guys opened up to me, and we were having great matches. Maybe, maybe I'm romanticizing the NWA champion, but I, I picture in my mind and knowing some wrestlers as friends, when you win a WWE champion, nobody ever really calls you, congratulates you, or talks about the past. And in my mind, when you win an NWA world champion, maybe a couple of the past guys from, from years past will give you a call or, or talk to you about how or what it's like to be a champion. Did any of that happen when you won the NWA championship? Um, I had, uh, obviously, my social media blew up. Um, I had a lot of guys, like you were talking about Ricky Morton, um, Ted DiBiase, guys, some of the, the, the veterans of our business that are on um, social media congratulated me. Uh, but I did notice, like, from when, you know, I've won other titles before, but when I won that world title, like, people really paid attention to me. Like, it's the first time in my life that I really felt like, like the world remembered and noticed, hey, Trevor Murdoch's here. He's back. He's, you know what I mean. Um, really, kind of put myself on that that statue of, hey, he's he's done something. That that's that's kind of was what I was wondering because, like I said, you don't really see that when someone else wins another tag team championship or or an intercontinental championship. So you you're part of this brotherhood of classic NWA legends. And that's, I can't ask for anymore. That's what I've, like, as a young guy and being a Harley guy, I know I keep reverting back to Harley, but, like, I do dream about it. Got, we would joke in training, like, how cool would it be to go back and, like, NWA and, like, be NWA World Heavyweight Champion just like Harley and have, and to actually be doing it and be bringing, being a part of relive, uh, reviving the, the new NWA to the people. Man, it's dream come true kind of shit. And, I'll be honest with you, if my career stopped today, like, I don't know if I could really beat it. I really can't top it. Well, I, I hope your career doesn't stop today. <laughs> no. and as Lars is loading back in, I definitely want to ask you about this second run had being a father. I, 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 once again, going back to your social media, I remember seeing pictures of your kid playing with a doll or a figure of yours. And you, you can show them video and you can you can show them pictures of what you've done in your past. But now that your son's old enough and you're NWA champion, does it does does it make you work a little harder? Or does he notice it? How does your kid view you now this second run? Um, I, I'm actually getting to share it with him. Like when we did the chase, we were up at the chase for four days. He got to stay at the hotel with me. He got to walk with me and see, you know, the people, you know, say hi, and get the autographs. He's been to other shows, but it's been because, you know, dad was the name and and that's what they're supposed to do. He really got to be a part of the whole production and got to spend time with Billy and the guys. Um, he really got to experience it for what it was and feel it live and, and feel the emotion. Uh, there's a picture of him hopping over the rail and bolting into the ring and giving me a hug after I won the world title. 
Like, it, that wasn't something, like I said, hey, son, when this happens, you know, come in the ring. That was that was pure emotion from, from him being like, I want to go in there and, and just, you know, hug my dad. And for me, it was an emotional moment. I get a little choked up just talking about it because, you know, I, he'll remember that for the rest of his life. You know what I mean? He was around for my WWE run, but he don't remember any of that. I've got pictures of him with Big Show. Kane, all the boys in the back, but he's little. Um, with this stuff, he's he'll remember it for the rest of his life. He'll remember he was there the second night I won the world title. Um, those are things that like, you know, you core memories, man, things that I, I can I can share with him for the rest of my life. Are you in the uh, one of those those guys that is kind of like you'll never shut the door to anything, you know, you'll always keep your options op open or now that you've experienced, you know, what you had in the WWE and other places, right? And now you're the world heavyweight champion for the NWA, which is one of one hell of a prestigious place to be. Are you kind of like, well, this is kind of where I need to be. This is where I'm going to stay. Or do you have ambitions to be other places someday? Man, fellas, this is Cinderella's found a shoe. Um, when I was a young guy, like I was open to all of that, like whoever will pay me the most to push, you know, um, NWA treats me right. When I'm in the ring, I feel like that's where I'm supposed to be. When I watch, when I watch the program, I feel like that's what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, this is where Trevor Murdoch is supposed to be right here. And at the end of the day, when NWA says, Hey, Trevor, we're done. Um, with you in front of the camera that's it fellas like this is where I'm I'm finishing my career in the NWA because in my personal opinion I won't be able to do anything to top what I've done just in in the short time that I've been been here you know what I mean uh, I'm, a, I'm a true true tried and true NWA guy I don't want to go to AEW I don't want to go to WWE I think they're you know they're, they're great in their own perspectives but Trevor Murdoch fits in the NWA and uh, I'm happy here. So this is, that's where I'm going to stay. This is, and this is where I'll end it off boys. Has, has there been any plans about Trevor Murdoch walking through any forbidden doors? Now I know you can't give away secrets or popping up, but that's the one thing I think a lot of wrestling fans want to see is, is the NWA champion showing up somewhere. We saw a little glimpse of it. I think in the early days of COVID with, uh, uh, AEW, I may be mistaking on that, but uh, ha has there been any talks? There was some discussions with AEW, but I think they kind of uh, fizzled out pretty quick on because they were talk they were talking about the forbidden door and with especially some guys getting injured. But I think that got that didn't last very long. But I'm really not inquiring. I'm I'm focused on the, the NWA and, and being the, the representative for the NWA. Well, now that you're, you know, you've sort of found your home, you found Cinderella has found his slipper in this case, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, is there somebody that maybe not be part of NWA right now um, that you've always wanted to get into the ring with and maybe you never had that opportunity? Um, I mean, as an artist, I as, a, as like an art as an artist, because that's what I think pro, wrestler, pro wrestlers are. They're, they're artistic. And sometimes, you know, the other guy can help paint that picture too. Um, there was, there's one guy and he's still doing a little bit of wrestling um, is Bully Ray. Um, I've always kind of had like a lot of respect for Bully because he came up through the business, in my opinion, the hard way. He went through ECW, made himself a name there, especially as a big guy, changed his gimmick, changed his character was successful all the way through. Um, and Billy, Bully's one of those guys that goes out there and, like, he wants to beat the shit out of people, too. You know what I mean? He's got that chip on his shoulder kind of wrestling. And I always thought me and Bully could go out there and really, like, throw down and, and get people excited about a, a fist fight. You know what I mean? Mm. Two guys just beating the snot out of each other. So – in wrestling, typecasting happens. And we talk to a lot of tag team guys who have just always been typecast as a tag team champion or tag team guy. How hard was it for you to break out of that mold to be viewed as a tag team guy 
and and make the singles run? It it took me like guys. I I haven't wrestled for WWE for I think we're going on like fourteen years, and I didn't really get out of that stigma of being a tag team guy until I won the world title the first time, like to like last year. Like people are like, oh man, he can do singles matches. I was like, holy shit. Like, have you watched anything I've done the last three years before this? Uh, it's, you know, it, you can't change people's perspective on on pe- some guy. You know what I mean? It's, dude, I get so, at one point I used to get so tied up in what people thought of me that it just, it made me crazy. And I don't know if it's age or or just being honoring, but I still give a shit what people think. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm in this really like fuck them mode. If you like me, you like me. If you, if you, if you don't, you don't. Like we, we worry way too much about what other people think, and it tends to dictate our lives. Um, so it's, I've really just done my best to go out there and do what I can do. And if they thought I was a tag guy, great. If they thought I was a single guy, great. But it took really winning the first title, the world champion, to kind of like set myself apart. Well, as we've been talking and we've covered so many things and, and, you know, I started kind of thinking to myself about your aesthetic, about who you are, right, as a wrestler. And, you know, you can be compared to, a Dick Murdoch, a Dusty Rhodes, a Stan Hansen, uh, a Harley race, of course, um, with your body type, right? With your mind, with the way that you work. So yes, and it's kind of like what, what Dennis was asking about that, almost that typecasting. So where does Trevor Murdoch go from here? How does he elevate that character to that next level? Man, that's, that's a really good question. Uh, to be honest with you, because right now I'm I'm kind of in no man's land with with what I'm doing. Um, I'm I'm just kind of going by my gut. The what the, what I'm going to be focusing on is trying to go out and bring a strong style style to my matches. When you go out there and see Trevor wrestle for the world title, uh, you're going to see an aggr- a more aggressive match, a more hard hitting match, uh, maybe quote unquote a little bit more believable match. Um, that's where I think I'm going to be able to take myself to the next level is every time somebody hears my name on the car, they know, wow, someone, someone can get their ass kicked. You know what I mean? We're going to see some hard hitting, hard hitting match. Did you see at the end of your first run that we, at the top of the show, we talked about your hiatus. Did you see that hiatus coming? And now (coughs) as the NWA champion, do you still have that fear that, holy shit, I could go several years without anybody even looking at me again? I don't understand. What do you, I don't understand. You so, broke up there a little bit. I'm sorry. The the uh, hiatus that you had in wrestling, did you see that coming when you were, when, when that approached? And oh. now that you're on the other end of it, NWA champion, do you still have that fear in you that that could happen again? Uh, or do you feel a little bit more secure now that you've grown into who you should be? Um, I didn't know. I didn't see the lull coming. You know what I mean? It's, it's one of those scenarios where you're a young guy and you think like, oh, you're always, well, I'm always going to have shows. I'm always going to be making great money. Um, so no, I definitely didn't see it coming. Uh, but whereas now, uh, now I'm not so fearful of it because I think before I felt unaccomplished, like, you know what I mean? Like, I felt like I hadn't really done what I wanted to do in the business. Whereas, to, like right now, like again, I made the comment earlier, like if for some reason my career got cut short right now, I'd be very satisfied with what I've done because I didn't expect to be here. I didn't expect for this to happen. Um, it's, I, I would be very happy with what I've done in the business. So, yeah, it wouldn't, if for some reason, you know, my, my time is over in the business, I'd be very satisfied with what I've done. I guess I got more of a fan question because I think the last time that I saw you wrestle in person was probably in 2005, 2006, maybe. And because I, right. I'm a West, I'm a West coast guy, you know oh, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And, and so, you, you know, I don't even think you even had the, the, you might've, uh, I, I kind of vaguely remember an intercontinental, there was something, maybe you were going after it or something like, I don't remember, but, it's very vague, but I guess my question to you is, is why the fuck 
isn't the NWA coming to the West Coast? Because I mean, we we you know we have we're the the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area of California has a long, rich wrestling history. Is there any plans to get you know to come out of St. Louis at any point and come come west? I for sure. Actually, next year, like Billy's got a lot of plans for us to start branching out. Um, he. You know, Billy was smart in the aspect like he wanted to he wanted to build our TV and he wanted to go to a couple spots where he felt like we could build a, a secure audience. Guys, just like in any business, you want to go to go to a place where you're for sure can hit some home runs. Does that make any sense? And he's he's taking time to not try to rush this thing and try to force feed it down people's throats. And we've now gotten to a point, especially. Um, just get you know getting over the pandemic we had some great momentum leading into the pandemic and when that hit it just knocked the legs out from under us uh also we lost several guys to AEW which was which was great we had to rebuild so we're, we're now getting to a point where we're really starting to create some momentum again and I know for sure uh next year they're planning on doing some shows out that direction okay well then don't fucking retire <laughs> okay or do any do any stupid shit until i get to right. see you again that would no problem bro i got you man for sure bro. You, you know uh you, you look like you're having more fun this time around though in the ring than you did the the last time around and is that counter counteractive to your training because have being trained by somebody like harley it, it, to me uh, it sounds like from what I know about those guys from the past is there's not supposed to be fun in wrestling. You're supposed to go in there. You're supposed to do a job and, 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 and get out and sell it. But the wrestling business has changed. So how, how does that work with your training? Um, man, I'm just, just like anybody else trying to adapt with the times. Uh, but I'm, I am way happier because I'm, I'm finally in a place that like I'm, my work is getting appreciated. Um, people are being upfront and honest with me. Uh, I get to go out and I don't have somebody boxing me in. Uh, you guys know it's the worst when someone calls you to do a job and then they go, but don't do this, don't do this. And you do this motherfucker this way. And I'm like, well, why don't you go fucking do it? Like, you know what I mean? Ah, yes. Whereas here, um, like when I, I asked them, I said, you know, hey, what do you guys want from me? And they said, we, we want you. I'm like, no, 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 no. I mean, like, what, what do you want? Like, I, no, Trevor, just go out there and be you. And it was a little startling at first. But once I was like, OK, now I'm relaxed. I can go out and do what I was trained to do, what I was bred to do, what I'm supposed to be doing. Man, just it's amazing how much magic can be created when you're doing something you love and and man nwa gave me my love of the business back because they let me go out there and do what i know i can do and that's that's tell stories and and make people believe that that what's going on in the ring is 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 a shoot you know and that that's my job you know uh the the, the quote you know again i've said it before you know you may think wrestling's fake but i'm real you know what i mean and that's that's powerful shit. Well, you know, I, I, this is a question. I don't know why I've never asked somebody and maybe we have, and I just forgot, but I kind of started thinking like when you, if you, you do a lot of Indies as well, you know, you're working continuously. Can you defend that NWA belt uh, just kind of on your own whim or is it something that needs to be okayed by the office and the other promotion is it does it does there need to be a joint effort uh, for working with something like that um i do have to get it screened through the office because i am you know representative of their company and uh so i do i do give the office the respect of especially if promoter calls me we work out the fee and and i then call the office and explain to them that this is what's happening and and i get i get the okay i'm not expecting to get a no but it's just a respect factor of me letting them know what I'm doing with their world title. I'm your world champion. I'm, this isn't just about me anymore. I represent a whole company. So I, I have to be respectful of the office when it comes to that kind of stuff. 
As we get down, I think we have about a question or a piece here. Uh, I guess my question is, with so many years in the making, did me interview you, interviewing you live up to what you thought this was moment was going to be? Because I know this is right below the NWA championship to have be interviewed by me after I probably have you know stopped what? you on Facebook and for Trevor, so long. He's got the same body type as you, too. So I, you <laughs> never know. <laughs> Five feet no, shorter, gentlemen, no. I'm, I'm- I'm thankful that I'm speaking to the, the guys that are knowledgeable, that are know about at least a little bit about my career and about what I've done and about the pro wrestling business. Uh, you have no idea how many times, and I don't know a large of you experience this in music, but they come to talk to you and they ask you like the stupidest fucking basic fucking retarded questions. And you're like, Man, do you know, like, have you opened up a magazine about, have you, have you just checked Wikipedia? Like, only 75% of that shit's true, but, like, have you made, done any research on this, on this interview? Um, and that, when, when I, when I get in front of people like that, I just get locked, I lock up, I give short answers, because if you don't give a fuck about the guy you're, you're asking questions to, why do I give a fuck about giving you answers? You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm just thankful that you guys came to me. Uh, as professionals with you know knowledgeable have real questions with information uh so yes i'm very thankful for this interview i wish well, we you know record we, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um well you know we wanted to get you right around before your first world title run we were having a hell of a time but i'm super thankful and happy that you're here and it's for free unlike somebody else in your company but uh, that's that's besides the point. Sorry, I'm gonna bear. You know, no, I won't bury him. But anyways, long story short, NWA belt. You holding the ten pounds of gold. How much of a part of you wants to steal that fucker and never give it back? <laughs> because Boys, you, you know, know. If, I, if if I was the NWA champ, I'd just be like, thank you. I quit later. I'm keeping this, you know? No, fellas, I, you, you, I, I, you joke, but, uh, you know, the first time I, I, I was going to lose it, you know, I, ha- I found out before I made it to the show and I, I literally sat there and thought, we're like, fuck these guys. Like, I just won't fucking go. Like, fuck them. Like, hey, what are they going to do? You know what I mean? Like, but, <laughs> Um, yeah, I had a thought, bro, but then I got to, you know, I got to be a professional and go, all right, all right, you know, but, um, the, the thing is you can take the, you can take the belt away from me, but my name's already in history, man. So at this point, like I've, I've done what I came here to do. You don't get a replica or anything like that for you to kind of keep for yourself. I, I did not receive one, (laughs) Billy Corgan. (laughs) I did not receive one. Um, but I, I probably will when the day, when my time in front of the camera is over, I will probably get one, um, uh, that way I've just got my own personal one. Harley always had his, never had the belt he won, but he, he always had a replica that he had made right after he won it and, and carried it around and kept it. So I'll probably end up doing the same. Yeah. You know what? I mean, does Ric Flair have that original one? If he does, I'm betting WWE has it now. <laughs> oh yeah i guess you're right i guess you're right you know what i mean boys like yeah, i mean I'm, yes. again i'm i'm not trying to be rude or anything but it's uh you know i'm like betting it. it's in some sort of archive somewhere it's collecting dust which is sad yeah all right but lars uh you kind of bounced around do you have anything else you know what i'm sorry about the internet problems to both of you because this is one of the ones no that i've been looking forward to for a long time and i feel like i missed fucking half of it so i'm just gonna go blow my fucking head off but anyway well, that just means you gotta bring me back man that's all you oh, yes bring me back and yeah not a, that is not a problem that is not a problem because i know that there, there's bigger and better things because i want to talk to you about japan and everything else there's oh, so much sure. well, i mean there's so much wwe I, that's i dude this oh, yeah. is fucking but this is the, as crazy as an interview as you are is there's there's a plethora of things that we didn't even talk about it just because you know the conversations always you know go where they're going to go but i got so many questions about your well, japan time I'll, and i'll give you a little easter egg for the japan stuff i was okay. there when the tsunami hit and wiped out tip of japan all that shit i was there 
I just went home a week before. And when, and when I'm, I remember when the news was saying like, oh, there's only about a thousand people. I said, ah, uh-uh, because bro. no one really understands how condensed the living spaces are in that country. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, man. So we'll definitely have to talk okay. about that my next road. Perfect. Where can people find you online other than the Facebook page I keep talking about? <laughs> yeah, guys, I, my only other two socials is Instagram and that real T Murdoch and then Twitter at, you know, at the real T Murdoch. And uh, of course on Facebook, I've got the little blue check mark. It only took me 10 years for Facebook to show me some love, but I finally got to shit. <laughs> it's what happens when you're NWA world heavyweight fucking champion. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> For everybody at home, the podcast is over. For us, we'll say our goodbyes off the air. NWA champion Trevor Murdoch, thank you for coming and hanging out with us. Thanks for having me, fellas.